Hello, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this UCL's Lunch Hour Lecture on Social Justice and Health Equity. My name is Ibrahim Abubakar, and I'm the Dean of the UCL Faculty of Population Health Sciences. I'll be sharing today's lecture, and I would like to start by introducing our eminent speaker, Professor Sir Michael Mahmoud. Sir Michael Mahmoud is professor here at UCL of Epidemiology, um, and also the director of the UCL Institute for Health Equity. Over the last nearly four decades, Sir Michael has led groundbreaking work on health inequity, outlining what we must do if we are to address the major challenges facing us around inequalities as it relates to health. He is the author of The Health Gap, The Challenge of the Unequal World and the Status Syndrome. In addition to leading a series of groundbreaking reviews, um, he's also been seminal to running multiple cohort studies that generate the evidence base for which he articulates policy in the UK as well as globally. He's an advisor to the WHO, to multiple governments nationally, and we're delighted with the emergence of Marmot Cities as an initiative and looking forward to the extension of that in multiple cities across the world. Michael has numerous honorary affiliations, including importantly, the Distinguished Visiting Professorship at the Chinese University of Hong Kong, and he co-directs um, the CUHK Institute of Health Equity. So before I hand over to Michael, I wanted to let you know that we'll have some time at the end of the lecture for questions, and then you can submit these questions on the Slido link. Um, just go to the link in your internet browser and enter the event code, hashtag social justice. Michael, if you are ready, my pleasure to hand over to you. Thank you, Ibrahim. And it's a pleasure to be doing this. I'm going to give a little bit of history. Uh, the opening line of my book, The Health Gap, was why treat people and send them back to the conditions that made them sick? Particularly at the moment in the UK, with the health service tottering under the strain of being unloved, underfunded, neglected. We think a great deal about the health care system, but my focus has been and remains on the conditions that make people sick in the first place, on the social determinants of health. I got this going in a policy way under the auspices of the World Health Organization. Uh, WHO was founded in 1948, and we had the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and Health as a Human Right. 1978 was Almirata and the Declaration of Health for All. And the Director General of WHO, when he launched the WHO Commission on Social Determinants of Health, which I chaired, he said it will come 30 years after the Almirata, oh, 30 years after Almirata, and we would like a similar ringing declaration to Health for All. And we said that we wanted to create a movement for health equity through action on the social determinants of health. And I'll show you some evidence that we've been doing that. The WHO Commission report, which as I said, I chaired, uh, we called it closing the gap in a generation. We put on the cover, social injustice is killing people on a grand scale. And the whole theme of running through the report was social justice. We said we wanted empowerment of individuals, communities, and indeed of whole countries. And we said it had three dimensions, material, if you don't have the resources to feed your children, you can't be empowered, psychosocial, having control, over your life, agency, and political, having voice. We wanted to create the conditions for people to lead flourishing lives. So that was the WHO Commission. In the wake of the WHO Commission, I was invited by then Prime Minister Gordon Brown to conduct a review of health inequalities in England, 
which we called Fair Society, Healthy Lives, the Marmot Review. And then I was invited by the European region of WHO to conduct the review of social determinants and the health divide in the WHO European region. The conceptual framework for the Global Commission, we had a distribution of health and well-being, inequalities within and between countries. These are influenced by material circumstances, social cohesion, psychosocial factors, behaviors, biological factors, and the healthcare system. And these in turn are distributed unequally in society according to people's social position, defined as how much education they have, their occupation, income, gender, ethnicity, or race. And this social stratification of these important determinants of health and well being are influenced by the socioeconomic and political cover context, governance, policy, macroeconomic, social health, cultural, and societal norms and values. And this is what we mean by the social determinants of health and health inequalities, the structural drivers the conditions of daily life and leading to unequal outcomes. And in the wake of those reports, I was then invited to lead the Commission of the Pan-American Health Organization on Equity and Health Inequalities in the Americas. PAHO is the American region of WHO. And to show you the kind of thinking that we had, this is a modified version of the so-called Preston curve. If you plot gross domestic product per person, adjusting for purchasing power parities on the x-axis and life expectancy on the y-axis at low levels of national income, income makes a big difference. So if Haiti got as rich as Bolivia, it is likely that life expectancy of Haiti would improve towards that of Bolivia. If Bolivia increased national income to the extent of Brazil, it's likely that their life expectancy would improve. So there's a steep relation between national income and life expectancy at low levels of income. But once you get up to around $17,000 per person per year at purchasing power parity, Costa Rica, Cuba, Chile, there's really no relation between national income and life expectancy. The US with national income per person at around $60,000 has slightly lower male life expectancy than Chile, Cuba, and Costa Rica. The US is richer than Canada per person, and yet Canada has significantly longer life expectancy than the US. In other words, at low levels of income, improving national income is the way to get better health or a way to get better health. But once you get up above a threshold, it's not higher income that will improve health of a country, but action on the social determinants of health. And we see social gradients in health in countries all around the world. This is from Brazil, looking at the socioeconomic level of the district in Porto Alegre in the south of Brazil. The lower the socioeconomic level of the district, the higher the mortality from cardiovascular disease. By attributable CVD deaths, these authors mean that the deaths attributable to having a socioeconomic level below that of the very top. It's a gradient. And something like 45% 
of CVD deaths are attributable to social inequalities. This is the US looking at life expectancy at age 50 by income decile. The men, the poorest 10%, had a small improvement in life expectancy by birth cohort at 50. So this is birth year of birth 1950, year of birth 1920. The next poorest decile had a slightly steeper increase. And then the higher the income, the greater the increase. So over time, inequalities in the US were getting much bigger. The gradient was getting steeper. Women, life expectancy went down in the bottom three deciles, the poorest percent. So the gradient got much steeper, but actually things got worse for the bottom 30%. Comparing the US and Costa Rica inequalities in mortality, that's the US by rank of socioeconomic status. And this is Costa Rica. You can see that the inequalities in mortality, the gradient is much steeper. The inequalities are much bigger in the US than in Costa Rica. So it's the level between countries and it's the inequalities within countries that can vary as well. And then I was asked, they said to me in the Eastern Mediterranean region of WHO, you've chaired a regional commission for Europe. You've chaired one for the Americas. You've got to do it for us. So I led the Commission on Social Determinants of Health in the Eastern Mediterranean region. Our conceptual framework looks rather similar to the conceptual framework for the Global Commission. The structural drivers, conflict and consequences, economic and commercial drivers, culture and society, and the natural environment, of course, including climate emergency. And we had chapters and recommendations on all four of these structural drivers and each of these conditions of daily life maternal and child health, early years, education, employment and quality of work, healthy aging, built environment, and health systems. And we use the phrase, do something, do more, do better. Meaning, if you're a poor country in the region, do something, it'll make a difference. If you're a better off country, do more. I was in Tunisia last week, and that's what we are saying to the Tunisians. Health's improved dramatically in Tunisia. You've done a lot, do more. And if you're one of the richer countries, do better. And we had recommendations on governance and political cultures, policies, research and monitoring. And we were particularly concerned with the position of migrants, refugees and gender. And the outcome of all of this is health equity and dignified lives. And here's the Preston curve for countries of the Eastern Mediterranean region. Gross national income per capita, adjusting for purchasing power. Afghanistan, before the takeover, the Taliban. Djibouti, if they got a bit richer, if they got up to the level of Egypt, life expectancy would well improve towards the level of Egypt. But then when you get up to Tunisia, Jordan, Lebanon, and go all the way out to the United Arab Emirates or Qatar, just getting fantastically rich is not the way to get better health. There's simply very little relation between national income and life expectancy. Once you get above this threshold of dire poverty, and again, it's around $17,000 per person adjusting for purchasing power. 
I've been turning my attention to the Western Pacific region. We've got, as you heard, uh, a companion institute at the Chinese University of Hong Kong. Look at Hong Kong, life expectancy in 2000 and 2018. Longer life expectancy in Hong Kong than in Japan. Macau, China, Singapore beat Australia, the Korean Republic, all very long, remarkable high achievers, OECD average. So you see that there's huge inequalities among countries in Asia and the Western Pacific region. And Hong Kong now leads the world in life expectancy. Female and male, a woman in Hong Kong can expect to live 87.7 years uh, life expectancy, um, 4.4 of a year longer than in Japan. Wow. Coming back to England, I said that I did the Marmot Review in 2010. In February 2020, just before the pandemic crashed upon us, we published Health Equity in England, the Marmot Review, 10 years on. We look back at the previous 10 years at what had happened. The recommendations that I had in 2010 were six, and we repeated them in 2020. Give every child the best start in life, education and lifelong learning, fair employment and good work for all, having enough money to live on, to live a healthy life, ensure a healthy standard of living for all, healthy and sustainable places and communities, and taking a social determinants approach to prevention. We've now added to tackle racism, discrimination, and their outcomes, and pursue environmental sustainability and health equity together. So what happened after 2010? Here's life expectancy from 1989. I could take it back to 1900. For women and for men, it had been increasing about one year every four years. And in 2010, 11, there was a break in the curve and the rate of improvement slowed dramatically, just about ground to a halt, and fell in the first year of the pandemic, about 0.9 years for women, something like 1.2 years for men. What happened in 2010? We had a new government elected conservative-led coalition government. They said, surely you can't be suggesting it's something we did that led to this slowdown. Well, we have to look at that question. You did have policies of austerity and rolling back the state. Maybe we've just reached peak life expectancy. They said other countries had austerity. So we looked at other countries. This is annual life expectancy improvement in weeks. Estonia, Norway, Slovakia, Hungary, Denmark, Belgium, Austria, Japan, Czech, Spain, UK. We had the slowest improvement in life expectancy of any rich country except Iceland and the United States. Note, we had not reached peak life expectancy. Note, it was not the case that all countries had austerity and a slowdown. And that's just what was going on. The UK had the slowest improvement of any rich country except Iceland and the United States. And at the same time, we had an increase in inequalities and life expectancy, just like I showed you in the US, life expectancy for the poorest people was going down. So looking at government policy after 2010, they had a stated explicit policy of austerity, cutting back on the state. Public expenditure was 42% of GDP in 2009-10, not very high by European standards, but high by UK standards. And over the years that went down, by 2019-20, 20, 
that 42% had become 35%. The first year of the pandemic, it went up again. Hey, guess what? If you think you need to, as a government, you can spend more. This was actually a political decision. It wasn't an economic necessity. It wasn't determined by objective economic conditions. It was a political decision. And it was more marked in the UK than it was in most other rich countries. In my 2010 review, we coined the phrase proportionate universalism. I was trying to combine two ideas. A typical British approach to social policy is you target the worst off, means tested benefits. A more Nordic approach is you have universalist systems. So I said, let's combine them. Proportionate universalism. We could call it leveling up. Here's the social gradient, let's say, in life expectancy, greater affluence, longer life expectancy. We want to level up. If we focus only on the poorest, yes, we may improve their health. But what about the people above the threshold who are relatively disadvantaged, but not at the very bottom? So we said, proportionate universalism. So universalist policies with effort proportionate to need. What did we get post-2010? Here's spending per person by local government, by level of deprivation. In the least deprived 20% of areas, the spending per person went down by 16%. Then the greater the deprivation, the greater the reduction in spending. In the most deprived, it went down by 32%. What we've got here is effort inversely proportionate to need. The greater the deprivation, the greater the need, the greater the need, the greater the reduction in spending. Could this have played a role in the slowdown in health improvement, the increase in inequalities, the decline in life expectancy in the poorest areas? Yeah, I think it could. Then came the pandemic. We said from the beginning, the pandemic would expose the underlying inequalities in society and amplify them. And so it proved. If we look at mortality by level of deprivation, so all-cause mortality, the greater the deprivation, the higher the mortality from all causes. And here's COVID-19. The gradient looks very similar to all-cause mortality. Males, all-cause mortality, COVID-19. Slightly higher excess mortality in the bottom three deciles of deprivation, the most deprived three deciles. We think because of exposure in frontline occupations and because of living in overcrowded households. I said that it would expose the underlying inequalities in society and amplify them. This is life expectancy 2018 to 20 compared with the previous triennium. Life expectancy fell for the poorest 40% of areas. In fact, for men, it didn't improve at all. For women, it improved the top 60%, but for both men and women, it fell, and the greater the deprivation, the bigger the fall. The inequalities were getting bigger. So that 2020, which was the first COVID year, exaggerated, amplified what we saw in the previous decade. And it means that women in the most deprived decile can expect to live a third of their lives in poor general health. So this is healthy life expectancy, and this is poor health. And th that poor health has been going up. 
And COVID, of course, led to great costs. Reduction in uh, spend, adult social care, public health, foregone savings, other services. So the total costs were an extra £6.9 billion, then a loss of business rates, council tax, uh, other loss, so costs and loss tax, uh, lost sales, fees and others, a total COVID burden of £11.9 billion. So a big economic hit. We've had three major challenges in Britain to health inequalities in recent times. The decade of austerity and health inequalities got bigger. The pandemic and health inequalities got bigger. And now the cost of living crisis is too soon to say if health inequalities have got bigger, but given what I'm gonna show you, it's entirely predictable that health inequalities will be increased. Food and energy billionaires did quite well from the pandemic, $453 billion richer than two years ago, and that's already a year out of date. Food insecurity. The Food Foundation has been tracking food insecurity, which means not eating enough to satisfy your appetite, missing meals because of inability to afford the meal, or going a whole day without eating. 17.7% of households in January 2023 in food insecurity. And one in four households with children. Proportion of all adults making energy efficiency improvements and or spending less on food and essentials due to the increase in the cost of living. So the most deprived and the least deprived. So spending less on food, shopping, and essentials, yep, the more you are deprived, the more likely you are to be spending less on food, shopping, and essentials. Making energy efficiency improvements goes the other way. The richer you are, the more likely you are to be able to afford making energy efficiency improvements. So in a way, it's a double burden not only has the price of fuel and food gone up, but you're less able to make improvements to do something about it. Citizens advice helped with crisis support. Um, so these are people who'd been to citizens advice before, and these are first time visitors to citizens advice um, with crisis support large numbers of people. Let's drill down a bit on energy costs. If you're in the top 10% of income in the UK, you spend about 6% of your income on fuel at home. If you're in the top 10% in France, you spend about 6% of your income on fuel at home. If you're in the poorest 10% in the UK, you spend 18%. Whereas in France, if you're in the poorest, you only spend 10%. That gap between the richest and the poorest in the percent spent on energy is the biggest in Europe. It's not good to be poor in the United Kingdom. It's not good to be poor anywhere, but particularly not good to be poor in the United Kingdom. And in fact, what's been happening to the economy since 2007, since the global financial crisis, is not great. This is from the Financial Times. It's looking at the deviation from the growth of GDP, the trend, 1990 to 2007. So. The economy was growing, GDP per person. 
after 2007. This is what happened to Germany by 2021. Germany is about 6% below where it would have been if that trend had continued. Japan is about 12% below. France, the US, Italy, and the UK. We're nearly one third lower. I heard George Osborne the other day boasting about how we were the envy of the rich world. Really? 2010? He said, until the Brexit referendum. Really? I don't actually see much break in the curve there. It just downward, 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 downward. Yes, then the pandemic, and we had a big economic hit from the pandemic, bigger than other countries, in part because we managed COVID so badly. And we're the only G7 economy to have not yet recovered to pre-pandemic levels. This is the fourth quartile of 2019 to the second quartile of 2022. Not great. I said it's not good to be poor in Britain, and it's certainly not good to be unemployed. If you're unemployed in Denmark, you get 90% of your previous earnings. In Sweden, 80%, Italy, 75 and so on. In the UK, universal credit going to unemployed is 14% of median income. Well, if you're unemployed, we're going to punish you. And this is the punishment that Joseph Roundtree Foundation and the Trussell Trust calculated what the cost was of basic essentials food, shelter, heating, clothing. And then they looked at universal credit for a single person and for a couple. And universal credit gives about 70% of what you need to cover essentials. If you're on universal credit, if you're unemployed in receipt of benefits, we guarantee you'll have poor health because we won't give you enough money to cover the essentials that you need to have a reasonable standard of health. What about health care? I said that my concern is not primarily with the health care system, but there's an intersection. This is average annual NHS spend by age and neighborhood deprivation. So this is the least deprived quintile, the next, and this dark dotted line is the most deprived. NHS spend is much higher in deprived areas than in less deprived areas. Why? Because there's more illness. You heard a politician saying, maybe we should charge people in the poor areas then they wouldn't use the health service so much. They're not overusing it. They've got more illness. If you want to reduce the burden on the NHS, we need action on the social determinants of health to reduce health inequalities. This is a pretty grim picture, isn't it? I'm not depressed. I'm pretty excited. More than 40 local authorities have declared themselves marmot places. I say to be confirmed, Kent Medway, but we're now working with them. All of these regions, cities, districts. Coventry was the first after my 2010 review. Coventry declared itself, didn't come from me, declared itself a Marmot City. Greater Manchester said, well, if Coventry can do it, we can be a Marmot City region. And we produced a report for them, Build Back Fairer in Greater Manchester, Health Equity and Dignified Lives, Cheshire and Merseyside, Altogether Fairer, a hopeful future, Lancashire and Cumbria, reducing health inequalities in Luton, a marmot town, fairer and healthier, Waltham Forest, working on Gwent. Uh, we're all over the UK. Wow, this is really exciting. And for the first time, we're working with business. Legal in general, a large commercial 
financial organization approached us and they said, what could we do and what could business do in general to address health inequalities? So we produced a report with them, the business of health equity, the Marmot Review for Industry. And we said three domains of recommendations, good quality work, pay every employee a real living wage, good benefits, good conditions, employment prospects, advancement, and the like. Goods and services. If you're the tobacco industry, we can't work with you because your core business is to damage health. If you're producing fizzy drinks, junk food, you're damaging health. If you're like legal in general and you're investing in large corporations, you can choose your investments to those corporations that are good for health, not those that are damaging health. So products, services, and investments. And then uh, the influencing, the wider impact on communities, the environment, employment practices, advocacy, and the like. One of our colleagues in the East London Foundation Trust said, hey, if business can do this, we can do this. So the East London Foundation Trust that provides services for the community in East London, including Luton, said East London as a training and employment provider, so be a good employer, provide good services for service users, and have a, an impact on the wider Luton community, anchor institutions. Hey, that's not bad. Case studies. Legal in general stimulated this case study of hidden workers. So, for example, outsourced cleaning activities, the people who work in these cleaning firms usually have the worst employment conditions imaginable, uh, low pay, terrible hours of work, bad conditions, no job prospects or security. It turns out that's not inevitable. At least one employer running a cleaning firm offering outsource services pays all his employees a real living wage, gives them good employment conditions. And we want to work to get other companies to be doing the same. And we've set up a health equity network supported by Legal and General. Uh, we now have more than 800 people signed up for this network with the idea of sharing what's happened and what is happening in cities, regions, and districts across the country. What we want them to be doing locally is our eight recommendations, give every child the best start in life, education and lifelong learning, fair employment and good work for all, having enough money to live on, healthy and sustainable places and communities, taking a social determinants approach to prevention and tackling racism, discrimination and their outcomes and pursuing environmental sustainability and health equity together. There are strong headwinds. National policy has been, as I've shown you, adverse, increasing child poverty, reducing spending on services. It's been adverse. It will take action. When we launched the WHO Commission in Santiago de Chile, the first meeting of the Commission, I quoted Pablo Neruda, the Chilean po poet, and said to my colleagues, rise up with me against the organization of misery. I think those words still ring true today. We want all the actors around the country to rise up with me against the organization of misery. Thank you. Thank you very much, Michael. That was an absolutely amazing and fascinating talk covering 
um, a whole range of issues. Um, so we have um, some questions coming in and I will urge and encourage colleagues uh, to add to the Slido page. Um, so the first question, Michael, if we are ready to get onto that is um, an individual asking um, that as doctors, how do we implement the knowledge of social determinants and health equity to provide a holistic individualist care to patients? So how do you turn, going back to the beginning of your career when you did individual patient care, how do we take these principles as good as they are if we're individual doctors practicing? Well, it's a very good question and a challenging question. Uh, when I spent a year as president of the World Medical Association and before that, uh, with the British Medical Association, I talked to the medical profession, which of which individual doctors are a part, and we said we need five spheres of action. First is education and training. So the individual doctor needs to understand the social determinants of health. The second, seeing the patient in broader perspective. Now, as an individual practitioner, if you're dealing with a rough sleeper, you might feel, well, I can patch up his ulcers and do something about his pneumonia, but I can't do something about his homelessness and his rough sleeping. Well, yeah, but you can't sling him back into the street either. And that relates, and I'll come to it in a moment, to the fourth of my recommendations. The third is. Um, the health system as anchor institution. What I showed you that East London Foundation Trust uh, is thinking about the impact on our community, on the environment and the like. The fourth, and it relates to the rough sleeper example, is working in partnership. As an individual practitioner, there isn't so much you can do by yourself. Social prescribing has taken off now, I think social prescribing in itself is a bit limited. I mean, it doesn't address the causes of the causes, but it's saying we recognize this patient's illness isn't just because of lack of pills, it's because of lack of physical activity, of money, of food, of shelter, and it means working with others uh, to try and provide those essentials. And the fifth is advocacy. You, as an individual doctor, um, can speak up on behalf of the patients and the community that you serve. Thank you. That's a comprehensive answer. So the next question relates to the commercial determinants of health. Um, and this person wants to know, how do we go about challenging and influencing the commercial determinants of health? Can it be made more explicit within uh, the model? Very much so. Now, I, I've seen the commercial determinants as a subset of social determinants and not as a separate issue. Um, you can treat it as a separate issue if you like, but I've not seen it that way. Um, and in a way, the work that we've done, the report we've done for legal in general, is saying, look, in public health, we have seen industry as the enemy. And for good reason. I talked about tobacco, um, junk food, alcohol, poor employment practices, and the like. And that's all real. And we have to do something about that. But our approach with legal in general and our approach to industry is to say, come on, be the good guys here. Don't be the bad guys. Um, you very important players with employment practices, half the population or more are employed globally, are employed in the private sector. Um, so we can't ignore private sector employment. Uh, food, half the population globally lives in cities. They're entirely dependent for food on the market, on people selling in the marketplace. So it's not like tobacco where we'd like no tobacco to be sold. We're all gonna buy food. So we've got to try and engage with the food market. Uh, the cost of nutritious food is higher than the cost of 
energy dense food, high in sugar, in fat and calories and salt. Um, we've got to engage nationally with government and with the providers to make it not disadvantaged from the point of view of cost to consume nutritious food. Um, and we've been talking to, uh, I've been talking to business in Hong Kong as well, and saying to ESG, environment, social and governance that corporations talk about, you need to add H, health, that you need to run your business with regard, not just to the environment, social and governance, but the impact on health. So I think we've got to engage with the commercial sector. Um, they're important players in our society for good or for ill on um, specific issues, the sugar levy taxing uh, soft drinks uh, does have some benefit by itself. It won't solve the obesity problem, but it did lead to some uh, reduction in consumption. So we have to engage with corporations. And I'd like to, this is my approach in general, I like to approach governments from the point of view of saying, come on, be the good guys here. And when I get disappointed, I then look for others who might rise to that challenge, which is why we're working with city and regional government all around the UK. Thanks, Michael, for that really balanced answer. Um, industry like governments can be quite varied and therefore our response and actions should take, into that, um, take that into account. So the next question, I've often heard you um, describe the impact of when you use the word health in its true broad sense, both physical and mental. But because of the sheer number of examples that you use being of physical health, I think a colleague is asking the very valid question of um, what about mental health provision? Is that not really important for good health? Absolutely. Um, let me say three things in relation to that. They're all connected. Um, uh, the first is, I've been saying for a long time that anybody whose prime concern is with mental health has to be concerned with the social determinants of health. And anybody concerned with the social determinants of health has to be concerned with mental health, no question. The second thing is to say that the mind is an important gateway, not the only gateway, but an important gateway by which the social environment impacts health, whether it's preschool, early child development, education, psychosocial influences in the workplace, the cost of living crisis. The cost of living crisis will impact on health because of not being able to afford food or cold, living in a cold home, but it also will impact on health because of the damage to dignity Having resort to a food bank to feed your children is a threat to dignity. Having to wear two overcoats indoors to stay warm is a threat to dignity. Having to cancel a child's birthday party because of lack of money is a threat to dignity. And that stress will damage mental and physical health. So. The mind is an important gateway, whether it's through behaviors, through stress, or through mental health. And then the third is that, as the questioner said, uh, mental Ill, Ill health is a key consequence of the social determinants of health. The evidence suggests that half the lifetime onset of mental illness, excluding dementia, is before age 14. So investing in good early childhood, the positive of good early child development and the, avoiding the negative of adverse childhood experiences 
will reduce the onset of mental illness. And it will also be good for physical illness. So I'm with the question at 100%. Thank you for asking that. Mental illness is absolutely a vital part of this. Thank you. So there's a specific question that relates to one of your slides, which is about the data on um, um, food, food insecurity. And the uh, person wants to know whether those data are broken down by ethnicity uh, or are they available broken down by ethnicity? Yes, they, they are. And in general, minority ethnic groups um, suffer worse from food insecurity. And in large part, that's socioeconomic, of course, because now that varies across minority ethnic groups um, that some groups are more likely to be socioeconomically disadvantaged than others. But in general, it is worse if you're from a minority ethnic group. So another question which relates to nutrition, um, and the person wants to know whether you think um, we should be teaching budgeting and cooking skills um, in schools so that adults, by the time children become adults, they have those skills. Um, Yes, uh, with a slight caveat. Um, a slight caveat. Let me say the caveat first. Um, any number of commentators, usually with cut glass accents that look like they've come out of some period movie um, uh, with period costumes, say, oh, you know, poor people just don't know how to cook. They're I could live on 30p a day or whatever. And, and um, the idea that people are feeding poor diets to their children because they're lazy or ignorant is deeply offensive, deeply offensive and immoral. We published figures from the Food Foundation showing that if you're in the poorest 10% of household income to follow healthy eating advice, you'd have to spend 74% of income on food. For the bottom 20%, you'd have to spend 47% of income on food. If you're in the top quintile, it's about 8%. So uh, people can't afford to eat healthily. So that's the caveat. Let me come to the good side. Finland, uh, always does best in Europe on PISA scores, the program of international student assessment that looks at children's performance on standardized tests at age 15 or 16. And Finland does the best. I made a pilgrimage to finish school and talk to uh, the teachers union and I was really struck that in a Finn school, the girls are taught woodwork and the boys are taught to cook. And um, they're taught a lot of other things too, but this is part of trying to teach people to take their place in society in an ungendered way. The idea that boys do all the woodworking and girls do all the cooking, uh-uh. That's not the approach in the Finnish school. Uh, we're trying to create well-rounded members of society. So by all means, learn cooking skills, uh, all genders. Thank you. So we have four more minutes left. I'll try and see if I can fit in two more questions. Um, the next one is on diversity and inclusion. And the person asking the question wants to know, um, how do we overcome the general lack of diversity of the public health workforce? given the institutional barriers for people from certain backgrounds? So it's a racism discrimination question. Yeah, um, I'll answer this question in a few months' time. Uh, the re reason I say that, we've been commissioned by the Greater London Authority to uh, look at the whole question of institutional racism and its impact on health. And that includes the workforce. And we've got a brilliant advisory group. We've been engaging with community groups, with special interest groups, and 
it's enormously challenging, enormously rewarding. And we're thinking a great deal about not just to submit a report to London, but how to, we hope, create a national conversation with it. So uh, forgive me if I don't answer it now, um, but it's very much on my mind and the minds of my, my colleagues. I am sure that the lunchtime lecture would invite you again to speak in a few months' time so we can get the answer. So the final question, and with really profuse apologies to others who have asked questions that we haven't got to, is um, how do we how do we do community engagement uh, better when designing policies um, or having individual conversations? Do you collect examples from the Marmot City's organizations that would allow us to learn? Yeah, I think the, the main thing, the main thing is a change of attitude. Um, there's no question that we need leadership. Um, and the Marmot cities around the country, um, Ibrahim, we met with Martin Reeves yesterday, who was the leader of Coventry City, and his leadership was inspirational. Um, so there's no question that we need leadership. But leadership doesn't mean being a know-all. It doesn't mean saying, I know what to do and I'm going to do it. It means leading the program. But part of all of that is community engagement. And um, I spoke to a group a while ago called the People's Powerhouse. They set themselves up kind of in opposition to the Northern Powerhouse. They said the Northern Powerhouse was all about infrastructure and high-speed rail links. We're talking about people. What do we need? Not will another high-speed rail link solve our problems, but what do the people need? And so it's absolutely vital. So what it needs is leadership, but the leadership means a change of attitude that the people's voice is absolutely key here. Thank you. So on that note, with a minute to go, I don't think we can fit in any more questions. And again, profuse apologies um, specifically to uh, Jemima, but everybody else who's asked questions that we couldn't get to all of them. Um, uh, it remains for me to thank you, Michael. Um, thank you for a fascinating lecture and for responding to the many, many questions. Um, I'm really grateful to the audience for your engagement and all the questions asked. Um, I very much enjoyed this last hour and I hope you have too. Um, so on that note, I'd like to close the event, but before I do so, can I uh, be cheeky and advertise the next lecture, which is on the 25th of May, on early life experiences and how they shape later life health by Dr. Nazif Alik uh, from UCL. Thank you very much, everybody, for attending and look forward to seeing you at the next lecture. Thanks again, Michael. Goodbye.